we just changed from biplanes to a monoplane. So the pilots were getting used to going from two wings to one wing, retractable wheels, machine guns in the wing, you know, variable pitch propellers to go faster. How's that? Unbelievable. <laughs> really? Unbelievably good. Yeah. For a number of reasons that I can't even begin to explain on camera at the moment. I'm actually here at Spitfires.com. I've had the privilege of flying a Spitfire today. And we're going to be talking to Mark Hillier because while we've been chatting off camera, we found out a lot, not only about Spitfires, but about some of the things that Mark has done. So, Mark, tell us about the history of this place and particularly the history of this aircraft. It's great that you've come down to fly with us today. You've flown from a Battle of Britain airfield. So this airfield opened in 1940. Uh, she was home to 46 squadrons of aircraft, Spitfires, Typhoons, Hawker Hurricanes. Um, and basically uh, there was 101 pilots that lost their lives flying from this airfield during the Second World War. So we're really proud to do what we do, offer flights in Spitfires and obviously give people their dream and give them the Spitfire smile, as we say. Hopefully you've still got yours. <laughs> Still, uh, still yeah. um, and behind us, we're, we're privileged to have a world record breaker. So this aircraft flew 27,000 nautical miles around the world. She's a Guinness world record holder. She's a Mark 9 wartime production Spitfire, constructed in 1943. She did 50 combat sorties uh, in 1944. Uh, she was damaged three times, so once with the wheels up landing, uh, once with a ground loop, and also she had um, a hang up on a bomb on one of her bombing sorties with the Canadian Air Force at the end of the war. But then she went on to serve with the Dutch Air Force after the Second World War. Uh, and then uh, obviously uh, the owner of the company, Matt Jones and Steve Bobby Brooks, decided to buy this aircraft uh, and then took it around the world in 2019. Fabulous. Yeah. So, I mean, clearly we're not flown in this one today. You operate the, the two-seater versions, and I notice you've got two of them. Does your property contain an annex, outbuilding, or stables? Was any part of it used for commercial or trade purposes? Contact us today to find out if you are owed a stamp duty refund from HMRC. We've reclaimed over £12 million in the last 12 months. We were talking actually about the one that is not flying today um, and fascinatingly you know the opening remark was where did you get this from and the answer was a hole in a field in France. Um, when you say how much of the aircraft is original and they say well it's had a new airframe, new wings but there's a few original bits on it. I, I, you know I, you can't take anything away from the fact that these are beautiful historic aircraft you know, you talk about the Spitfire smile. Mm. I'm still processing, and I've, I've been on the ground now for an hour. It has been an absolute privilege mm. to both be flown in and to have the chance to fly one of these aircraft. And anybody who knows the history of the Battle of Britain, and, and particularly in the light of what you've just said, mm. you cannot fail to be humbled by the fact that you have sat in one of those airframes. Um, yeah, I mean, emotionally, you just can't process no. it. <laughs> you, they did warn us. You did warn... Whoa! That's, that's staying in. That's staying in. You see, that's me. I've still got the shakes after the flight. <laughs> they did warn me at the start that, you know, quote, you are going to feel things. I thought they meant during the flight, which, by the way, is amazing. Take one if you get a chance. Um, but, yeah, it's the feelings you get after that are the really interesting parts about it. So... 
on another subject, I mean, when we were talking, you, you're an author, you've, you've, you've appeared on uh, television and, and, and in documentary series. Is there really that still that much demand for, for history of the Spitfire? It's amazing, really. Um, we see so many people that come in that had relatives in the Second World War with untold stories. Uh, you get log books, uh, they get metal groups they don't really understand about. And often, as the historian here, people will come in and say, can you tell me a bit about Dad's flying? Uh, we flew a guy last year, turned up to fly in our, one of our two-seaters, uh, and he just had Dad's log book and a piece of metal from an aircraft that his dad had crashed in 19. 44 uh, and he said I don't know who he flew with uh, he said but could you research it and then he went flying in the aircraft I researched his father's background and his father had had engine failure in Italy in 1944 never spoken about it and uh, the piece of metal was from a piece of his aircraft that an Italian farmer had used as a hen house roof and his father went back years later to cut a piece off as a souvenir <laughs> so so yeah there is a massive demand and and people want to know what they're about and um, you know is the legend true uh, does it perform the way that uh, that people say it does and it always always never disappoints uh, people just fall in love with it and even from an engineering perspective if you look at these most of the curves that you see on the aircraft around the different fillets all formed on an English wheel handcrafted and if you look at the leading edge of the wing here you'll see that the leading edge doesn't fit quite it's because it's actually hand crafted and yeah. fitted to that aeroplane so if I, if I was to take this skin off it wouldn't fit another mark 9 spitfire so rosie the riveter as they used to say you know during the second world war lots of women taking up men's jobs uh, in aircraft construction they would be there with these sort of almost lost skills making this on an english wheel and hand crafting everything so even if you take away the fighter aspect of it, just the pure beauty of the engineering, you can't get away from it. It's the most fantastic aeroplane ever constructed. I'm biased, I know I am, but <laughs> who wouldn't be? And you cannot fail but be respectful and slightly humbled by thinking of the men that flew in these aircraft. I think we must never forget that in a time of war, the country came together as, as you would, and I'm sure that today we would probably do the same thing. I'd like to think we would. But to think about the, the, the efforts that went into making these aircraft, this actually only flew in 1936 and then was in production for the Second World War. We just changed from biplanes to a monoplane. So the pilots were getting used to going from two wings to one wing, retractable wheels, machine guns in the wing, you know, variable pitch propellers to go faster. It was an incredible feet and something we should never forget we should always be proud of our engineering prowess back then and our aircraft industry which sadly now has, has declined a bit you know I think it's on the growth again but yeah I'd like to think that the youth of today we would pick up where they left off if we needed to but we're never going to see the engineering might that we had before in my view you know to create such aircraft in a short space of time yeah I mean of course remembering that um the, the Spitfire as a, as, as a fighter was actually originally developed as a racing seaplane, wasn't it, of course? Yeah, yeah, and I believe it, was it Lord Beaverbrook or Beaverbrook who essentially was behind that development? So the Supermarine S6 was the race plane that they developed and obviously Supermarines were well known for their float planes and, and uh, you know, uh, seaplanes, basically. Um, but actually this was designed, uh, a competition called F-35, F-735 was the original Air Ministry competition they put together for a single, single wing monoplane fighter um, but that was lost originally by supermarine um, they went down the line of that sort of racing plane but it had a gold wing on it um, but it um, basically wasn't as good as the Hawker Hurricane which won the competition um, so supermarine then continued as a private venture to fund the development of the Spitfire there was no government money to start with and it started with supermarine developing it followed by uh, Rolls-Royce putting money in because obviously they were developing the Merlin engine uh, and then the air ministry got really interested and went we really like that I think we're going to keep an eye on it and we'd like to have some input into the development of it so it was purely a British company sort of you know pushing their product and actually trying to develop it that ended up in this beautiful design so yeah it changed it wasn't a government it started as a government idea as a procurement for a aeroplane but then privately developed yeah, so, you know, an example of how British innovation earnestly pursued can actually produce a world leader and indeed a world winner. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, it's fascinating. Well, Mark, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure we've probably taken enough. Ladies and gentlemen, as I've said, go on to spitfires.com, try this experience, 
I hope you've enjoyed listening to Mark. I've certainly enjoyed my day down here at Goodwood. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon.